Hello everyone, and this is going to be a lecture uh, around uses of the erotic. Please use this in your discussion as well as a sort of a guide as it leads you through the readings and so forth. So one of the things that you've probably noticed in this class is that throughout this I've been trying to, in many ways, weave together or connect together various threads. So. And as we go further on in this semester, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about before is going to be keep coming back around in order for us to sort of talk about it in more nuanced and in deeper ways. So for this week, the central sort of text that we're looking at is Audre Lorde's uses of the erotic. And we're using that as a bridge to look at the other texts that are assigned for this week, as well as the larger questions around not only what the erotic is, or essentially what Audre Lorde's argument is, but also how it is connected to not only the authors, the other authors that we're reading's arguments, but as a force of radical change and so forth. So a couple key themes in the readings for this week, uh, using Audre Lorde's piece, is around the concepts of, particularly around female sexuality. So, uh, for example, the Ornstein's chapter that we're reading really focuses on the discussion around virginity and the very limited discussions around virginity and the pressures that particularly young women face around this. But also this is being played in the piece by Cisneros, which is around Guadalupe the sex goddess. So on one hand, we're using the erotic to look at a very interesting and particularly troubling trope of virginity. At the same time, we're looking at the... At the way that particularly female sexuality, female sensuality has been used to either silence women, to demonize women, particularly women of color, indigenous women, Latinx women. So using the erotic, we're, t we're taking Audre Lorde's argument about women reclaiming the erotic and then looking at it from multiple ways. One around the sort of what we would talk about, what we've talked about before, this virgin whore dichotomy, but also connecting it to how this has been historically used to oppressed women, particularly indigenous women, as well as women of color, and how by reclaiming the erotic and using it as a force of power, it can be not only a way to reclaim female sexuality or your own sort of senses of sexuality, regardless of how you identify across the gender spectrum, but also as a way to challenge systems of power, particularly ongoing colonial systems of power. And in this section, I'm going to break that down a little bit more. I really want to talk about Audre Lorde. One, um, because I'm a super fan. <laughs> um, and so it's my class, so I get to then, you know, decide on who I get to gush about. So I'm gushing about Audre Lorde, but hopefully you will gush about her too. Um, but also the reason why uh, we're reading Audre Lorde is that she's had a profound impact not only on feminism and discussions around feminism in regards to sexuality and so forth, but also in the field that I'm more firmly located in, which is in queer studies and LGBTQ studies. She is in many ways a matriarch. But her work continues to be read. Uh, she was a poet, an author, um, warrior, and so forth. And her work still has incredible amounts of resonance today. So just a little bit about Audre Lorde. Um, for those of you who've never encountered her before, and I'm really glad that you get to encounter her in this class, um, Audre Lorde um, uh, described herself as a black lesbian mother warrior poet. All of that <laughs> never shortened that because for her she saw herself and she argued around the fact that you cannot separate one piece of her identity from another she dedicated her life and her creative talent both as a poet as well as a teacher and a writer and so forth to confronting and addressing the intersections of her life as well as the intersections of other people's lives in regards to the injustices of racism sexism and homophobia which for her, she experienced on all aspects.
Um, her work is very much central to black feminist thought and theory, but we can just talk about her impact on feminism thought and women's studies in general, and has been essential in particularly in queer studies and queer persons of color thought and theory. So the poem or the, the, the speech that we're uh, reading about was part of Audre Lorde's process of being unapologetic about her desire. And we offer it uh, in this sort of um, oracle form so that when you read that you can uh, challenge yourself and each other to unapologetically express and explore your own desire and your own person in your own personal political and spiritual lives. So as before, why do we read Audre Lorde? Well, for a lot of reasons. One, when you read her works, and she's written several works, so um, a poetry as well as just personal reflections and lectures, it's very enjoyable to read. She's an incredibly gifted writer. Um, but also, it's uh, she wrote uh, predominantly in the 1980s as a way to critique the me uh, the feminist movement at that time, which was very much predominantly overrun by white middle class women. It doesn't mean that women of color, queer women, women with disabilities, LGBTQ individuals weren't a part of the movement, but unfortunately, they were very much silenced in the movement. And Audre Lorde was a very vocal critic to that. So for her, her work very much was fundamental in emphasizing intersections of race, sexuality, gender, and class, among others. And she was very much a vocal critic of the feminist movement, as well as challenging the lesbian and gay rights movement uh, that ignored particularly persons of color. But a big part of her scholarship or her writings um, was also around creating uh, these new ideas and connecting not only our intellectual process, but with our body, um, with our emotions, with our feelings, with our sensations. Like, why is knowing or knowing about the world or understanding the world only experienced through one sense, when in reality we experience it through many senses, as well as through memory, through relationships, and so forth. So if all of these things build up our knowledge about the world around us, why are we just emphasizing one sort of form of, of knowledge? Like, for example, just thinking. When in reality, thinking is also very much connected to feelings and sensations and emotions and so forth. She very much emphasized in her work feeling or emotion as a source of knowledge and power. And in that, also using emotion, using thought, using, using your body as an act of resistance. So what I have in Canvas is both the, um, the written piece, the uses of the erotic, um, as well as uh, Audre Lorde, actually the speech that she gave, which is the same thing. So you can read both or listen to, or you can read or listen to both. That's fine, whatever you want to do. But I want to kind of break it down a little bit more for you and we'll help you in the discussion for this week. So Audre Lorde writes, there are many kinds of power used and unused, acknowledged or otherwise. The erotic is a resource within each of us that lies in a deeply female and spiritual plane, firmly rooted in the power of our unexpressed or unrecognized feeling. In order to perpetuate itself, every oppression must corrupt or distort those various sources of power within the culture of the oppressed that can provide energy for change. So what is Audre Lorde talking about here? Let's break it down some more. So what is the erotic? Now, now Audre Lorde in this piece purposely doesn't define the erotic as essentially just one thing. She talks about it as a source of personal power and political power. She also describes the erotic as a powerful feminine force of personal power within each of us. And it's very much, uh, she didn't write it at the time, again, this was written in the 1980s, but 
I think we can sort of extend it that it's not belonging just to one gender, meaning that it is a feminine power, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is only inherent or only in the possession of feminine or female identified bodies. I think all of us, especially those who identify male or on, on the male spectrum, could also sort of say that they have the erotic within themselves as well. In fact, maybe it should be emphasized some more. But going from there, she talks about how it is a vital and deeply felt resource that rises from the most mysterious parts of the self. She talks about it as an inspiring sense of fulfillment, pleasure, and completion that can infiltrate every area of life, including the bedroom, but not solely just the bedroom. So don't just think of it merely as um, sensuous, uh, sexual, physical action. It is involved in that, but it's not just that. And for her, she sees it as allowing one to live a life of wholeness and profound satisfaction. Why is it erotic? Why is she using the word erotic? She talks about this because it's very purposeful. She's actually reclaiming this word, which has been used in many ways to hypersexualize and demonize women, like your eroticism and, you know, you're being too erotic, right? She actually goes back to the root of the word, the Greek root of the word, where it's derived from the word eros. And eros, as she talks about, personifies love in all its aspects. And that's one of the really interesting things about when you look at, for example, Greek myths, that a lot of these sort of emotions that we kind of a lot of times think about in one dimension, like eros being love, or, you know, another deity be meaning anger, that it oftentimes it's much more broader than that. It's not just like love in the sense of like, I love you or I'm obsessed with you, but love in many other ways that we can sort of expand love beyond just I love you, but to I love myself, to I love this feeling, to I love this tree, to I love in general. Like, so again, so love in all its aspects. So expanding that notion. She also talks about, as she says right here, there is for me no difference between writing a good poem and moving into the sunlight against the body of a woman I love. Meaning that love can encompass all of that, right? From the pleasures of reading a book or writing a good poem, as Audrey says, to the pleasures of enjoying another person's company, to the feeling of the sun on your skin. And it's really important, because Audrey emphasizes this, that it has nothing to do with pornography. And what she means by that, it's not necessarily about, um, you know, anti-porn or anti-sex or any sort of like shaming around that, but talking about it in a way that, you know, particularly when we talk about pornography as being very much dominated by a male dominated interest uh, industry, mainstream porn being very much for the male gaze and saying like, no, 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 no. We're not part of that. We're not part of one objectifying women, hypersexualizing women, cutting women away from their own sense of sexual and sensual selves instead we are reclaiming our sensual sensuality we are reclaiming our love we are reclaiming our sexuality all of that outside of that sort of system so again for her it has nothing to do with pornography it has everything to do with the personal social aspects around love so as Audrey talks about, the erotic is very much female. And what does she mean by this? She says that the erotic is a resource exists in each of us on a deeply female and spiritual plane. Again, as I've emphasized before, Laura does not say that men do not have um, this power. She never says it. In fact, you know, you would you can even argue that men have this source, this female sort of spiritual, sensual, loving self that unfortunately due to patriarchy and toxic masculinity and all of that grossness has been denied or repressed. And she talks about that, you know, when she describes the erotic, she talks about the sort of 
the word spoke to the feelings women were having in company and community with women at the time. So again, she is talking from a particular location in regards to being a queer woman in the 80s and sort of connecting with other queer women and talking about this profound sense of love, connection, and so forth. She also, in that then, in recognizing this connection, a connection that women share, and not just women, but this connection anyways, she also talks about how it has been demonized and has been used, the erotic has been used to demonize femininity and femaleness. And that makes a lot of sense in regards to that if we say that the erotic is also, men possess this as well, but has been demonized, right? You know, men can't be sensuous, men cannot be loving, men cannot be feeling. Men totally can and totally should, but in our culture we have very much demonized that. And in ways that we've demonized women as well. And she talks about that you can be a woman, be a man, or someone that falls within the gender spectrum or across the gender spectrum and embrace the erotic. And that it doesn't necessarily have to do with sexual orientation either, you know, but self-love. Um, embracing female sexuality, pleasure, love, and power. So it's not just about, you know, women desiring other women, but about all of that, meaning like women loving other women, women loving other men, men not loving other men, men and everyone across the gender spectrum loving each other, okay? So it's, it's also not related to the strictly sexual orientation. So you might be thinking like, okay, well, the erotic seems really broad and abstract, you know, and yeah, it purposely is. Audrey Lord is purposely not trying to pigeonhole it. But if you wanted to think about it in other ways, beyond just sort of the sense of love and connection that is very much, as Audrey Lord describes it, as a female energy, but again, not solely resting in a particular gender identity, we can talk about it as connecting body, mind, and spirit. So a lot of ways we can talk about it in regards to radical self-love, you know, which is something that uh, luckily and thankfully has been talked about more and more about loving yourself, seeing also your, the sort of defiance and that like, this, this, uh, despite what culture, society, history has done, particularly to women, especially women of color, women with disabilities, queer persons, etc., to deny them the right to love, to be loved, and to love themselves by reclaiming that, by loving yourself by caring for yourself, this sort of radical sense of love, you are reclaiming the erotic. So she also talks about, you know, embracing your sex, sexuality, and desire. So, and regardless, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be sexual with somebody else or even sexual with yourself, but about reclaiming that, taking ownership of it. Because for so long, as we sort of explored before in other readings, particularly when we talk about women and girls, that their sexuality, their sex, their sensuality has been a lot of times uh, objectified or seen as something that's not a part of them, but in use of service, particularly to other men. And saying, no, 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 this is yours. This is your power. Not only do you get to decide what you want to do with your body, but you also get to sort of embrace all aspects of this deep, intimate part of yourself. And so she talks about also, if you want to think about the erotic, you can talk about it in seeking pleasure in all aspects of your life. So not just sexuality or sexiness or engaging in sexual activities, but, you know, enjoying things that bring you pleasure, not pleasure for others, but just for you, you know, whether that's uh, listening to the music you love, to wearing a shade of chapstick or lipstick that you love, or not wearing that, right? Again, embracing that sort of, that sort of pleasure for yourself as a way of reclaiming the erotic. And honoring yourself and your feelings. So really checking in with yourself, really seeing like, well, how do I actually feel about this? What makes me whole? What makes me well? So 
if we wanted to talk about the erotic, we can talk about reclaiming, reclaiming your sexual power, reclaiming your love and your body for yourself. So some of the questions that we're going to be discussing in the discussion section is around how do you see the erotic in your life, you know? And it doesn't necessarily have to be sexual in nature. It can also be something that is much more broader in scope or much more sort of other sort of sensations that we wouldn't necessarily think of as sexual, but are loving and sensual. So... We can explore then also how do you see it in everyday life and how do you see it in your life. Audrey Lord talks us, told us that the, the erotic is power that has to do not only with sex or sexuality or sexual feelings, but feeling everything we do as deeply as we were feeling sex. And what she means by this is that we can have, that you know, for her, again, it's not just about engaging in sexual activity, but the feeling of being alive, being present, being connected, being loved and loving to ourselves, to others, to other everything, all sort of aspects of our lives. And that reclaiming that, and what she talks about is feelings of being alive and alive through our skin, reclaiming that feeling is also a way of reclaiming the erotic. So, you know, for me, if you were going to ask me, like, how do I see the erotic in my life? I see it in many ways. I see it when I look outside and I see the trees blooming. And even though I am sneezing, I smell the budding flowers. And I feel an incredible sense of not only the changing season, but also feeling alive in that moment when I see that. I can also talk about cooking, right? You know, I'm not a great cook. But the feeling of enjoying good food, making food for others that I care about is very much a sense of, again, feeling alive, feeling present, taking care of myself, taking care of others, love in all that aspects, right? Eros. I see that as a part of reclaiming the erotic for me. Two, like self-care, like, you know, things like a very nice hot, warm bubble bath can feel not only incredibly relaxing and sensuous, but also, again, a way of taking care of myself, of loving. Two things that intellectually stimulate me, you know, that make me feel inspired or even make me feel angry and I want to, like, respond, right? It makes me feel alive and present. And that the feeling that I am empowered to not only engage in that, but to respond in that work, whether that's through my writing, through my lecturing, and so forth, I see that also as an aspect of the erotic. To just being inspired by looking at others, you know, for example, the Chilean uh, feminist movement and their chant around rape culture has been incredible for me. I played on the loop a lot of times, and even though I don't speak Spanish, I am incredibly moved by this these women. I've actually attached a link to the module. You don't have to watch it for the discussion, but just so that you can see. But again, all these aspects, you know, one thing cannot separate the erotic from me because all these things kind of represent it for me beyond just, you know, physical intimate pleasure with others or with myself and so forth. The erotic is dangerous. And what I mean by this is that here you have this source of power, you know, this feminine source of power that doesn't belong necessarily to just those who identify as female, but is across the gender spectrum that emphasizes on love and connectivity and emotion, which essentially is the antithesis to a lot of the world we live in today, particularly in a capitalist neoliberal society, which is what we live in. So we live in a capitalist society, right? Which you know, if you want to talk about capitalism and neoliberalism, refers to the policies and processes whereby a relative handful of private interests or private individuals are permitted to control or own as much as possible of social life or social resources like food, money, shelter, etc. in order to maximize their personal profit. Neoliberalism and capitalism depend on distances distances and a separation from individuals, right? Because we because collectivity destroys 
competition, right? If we're all sharing resources and working with one another, then how does anybody make a profit, right? Because you need to sort of have a group of people who have something and a group of people who don't have something. And therefore, then you can like sell things or create a competition and so forth. In a collective caring world, capitalism and neoliberalism don't work because capitalism and neoliberalism removes connectivity and emotion from policies and practices as well as from each other. It is a system where everyone is out for their own needs and only the strongest or most privileged will benefit. Now, Audrey wrote this piece in the 1980s at the height of many would consider sort of like the boom of capitalism, though not much has changed since when Audrey wrote this. And she she's talking about the erotic as a way of reclaiming it, as well as a warning about the future. She says she talks about a future in which even the good is commodified, a future organized around male models of power, where the doing of the good is trivialized and emptied of deep feeling, sensation, connection to our innermost senses of power, communal experiences of shared emotion, and the senses of higher purpose that are often catalyzed in the doing of good. So Audrey is speaking to a world that she sees in which even the love, caring, good, is commodified, meaning that you then sell it. Therefore, basically destroying the whole thing of the erotic, which is about not hoarding or withholding, but sharing and loving. Lord cautions in her speech that the principal horror of any system which defines the good in terms of profit rather than the terms of human needs, or which defines human needs to be exclusion of the psychic and emotional components of that need, the principal horror of such a system is that it robs our work of its erotic value. So when you start commodifying things like food, shelter, physical care of one another, kindness, compassion, human dignity, when you start separating and deciding who can have that and who can't, who is deserving of that, who is not, who has enough resources or money to be able to afford that luxury, which shouldn't be seen as a luxury, but is now being seen as a luxury, it robs us of our of the erotic. It robs the very core part of the erotic, which is around love. And Audrey talks about how the erotic then, therefore, is repressed in a patriarchal society, which is what we live in. She talks about how the erotic, again, this feminine sense of love, sensuality, mutual connection, emotion, is deframed and corrupted in Western culture. And as a result, women are both sexually oppressed and exploited in a male-dominated patriarchal system. Women are, have been made to suffer and to feel both con contemptible as well as a suspect of their virtue of its existence, meaning that they are seen as both threatening and dangerous, as well as disgusting. Women are then taught to fear their desires, their sexuality and pleasures in exchange for a very patriarchal script of sexuality that only benefits men. And according to Lord, empowered women are dangerous and are thus taught to disassociate from the erotic. Audrey Lord sees the erotic, therefore, as not just a, a personal experience that you have, right? You know, what we've talked about before and about how it can be incredibly healing to reclaim it. But she also talks about the erotic as a political force of change. She talks about how the erotic is a source of personal power and it's also an underused political force. The erotic can be a source that makes one less willing to accept powerlessness, resignation, despair, self-effacement, depression, and self-denial. You know, and if we think about the way that Audrey's talking about it, we can talk about how the power to feel in our bodies is a subversive power. Because, and you think about it, in the ways that how women's voices have been denied, right? Yet we've, you know, you know, so 
often in the culture, a woman, particularly women, have to sort of keep on talking or having to fight just to be listened to. And that their own sort of experiences are devalued, right? So reclaiming those experiences, seeing them as a source of power and truth is a way to to not only um, bolden women, but to also use it as a force for change. And that if we listen to it, we can change the world. Audrey Lord uh, used these quotes, but... Um, we can talk about other quote, uh, other people who very much are inspired by uh, what Audre Lorde was talking about and kind of are talking about the same thing, such as Muriel Ruskiris asked, what would happen if one woman spoke the truth of her life? The world would split open. When we use that sort of source of power, what can we do with that? It can be incredibly transformative. And Adrian Rich wrote, Two women eye to eye, a whole new poetry beginning here. Again, the transformative power. So Audrey very much is not only talking about the erotic as a source of self-reclaiming, but also by using it in collections with other women or a coalition of other women, people in general, it can be an incredible source of power. Audrey Lore talks about seeing coalitions coalitions built around the erotic can be made with the power that comes from sharing deeply any pursuit with another person. That is also part of the erotic and can be a very transformative force of change. So just to recap, because we've been exploring the erotics more, and I want to use now the erotic to look at other aspects, especially the other two readings, we can talk about the erotic in a lot of ways. And again, Audre Lorde purposely is trying not to define it in one way because she doesn't see it in one way. She sees it in many sort of planes, if you think about it, both personal, political, social, etc. So, if we, but if we want to talk about it in some ways, we can talk about how the, the erotic, at least how Audre Lorde's using it as this personal feminine sexual power that everyone has within them but have been denied. The emphasis on love, pleasure, and bodily connection, both within yourself and then with others, as well as then by reclaiming that and then also using that in coalition with others as a place of resistance. So core sort of takeaways you can think about from Audrey's pieces, one is around taking charge or ownership of one's sensuality, sexuality, love as well as using it as a way to critique around the historical and ongoing demonization and dispossession of women, particularly women of color and indigenous women, by patriarchy, and using that to also fight against historical oppressions, uh, working to control female sexuality, as what we're going to talk about now in regards to colonialism. Everything we talk about, regardless of whatever topic we're talking about, doesn't happen in a bubble. And that is why at the beginning of this course, we talked a lot about settler colonialism, which seems, I guess, a little bit abstract for a fe course on female sexuality. But the truth is, is that, you know, you can't talk about things from as, sim from as straightforward as like public health education, like sex education to uh, talking about how do we feel about our own selves without talking about the other various forces at play that have historically and still very much not only, you know, infiltrate every aspect of society in regards to female sexuality, but have been used historically and continuously to dispossess, demonize, particularly women of color and indigenous women's own sense of sexuality. So if we want to talk about the erotic, particularly in regards to being it as a force of political change, we need to talk about historical forces that continue to not only suppress the erotic, but demonize it and dispossess that from women. So just a little bit of connecting to it. So again, going back to a couple weeks prior where we were talking about settler sexualities and this is just a recap so that you kind of remember again refresh some of the terminology we, we were what we were using uh you know so we live in a settler colonial society 
you know, the United States is a settler colonial society. Pretty all of the Americas is a settler colonial societies. And again, remember, settler colonialism is a form of colonization where foreign individuals are moved into the region, changing the landscape and usually displacing the original inhabitants. And what's really important about settler colonialism is that it creates a hierarchy of racial and gender priority in which the settlers are superior than the inhabitants, and not only superior to the inhabitants, but creates a hierarchy of which settlers get the most rights and which settlers do not. So that's where then you get racism around people of color that are not indigenous, who are also settlers, but are also feeling the incredible amounts of violence of settler colonialism. The other big thing about settler colonialism is that it is still ongoing. It hasn't ended. And remember from a couple of weeks ago when we talked about settler sexuality, it's defined as very much a racial and gendered process, right? So a white national heteronormativity that regulates indigenous sexuality and gender by supplanting them with the sexual modernity of settler subjects, particularly white and heteronormative. Settler sexuality can be described as an exceptional form of sexual expression enforced by the settler state that has not only impacted indigenous peoples of, for example, Native Americans, First Nations individuals, but also to other settlers, particularly settlers of color, so African Americans, Latinx, um, Asian Americans, and so forth, right? Creating a, a very much a gendered sexual racial hierarchy and in that then sort of process you know deeming only certain forms of gendered racialized sexualized configurations as the norm right so white heterosexual monogamy as exceptional and normal and anything beyond whiteness heteronormativity um as well as patriarchy so devaluing of women as primitive and unexceptional so we've talked about settler sexuality and settler colonialism, particularly in the very long historic as well as ongoing forces in regards to regulating particularly indigenous and women of colors, sexualities, bodies, reproductive capabilities, and so forth. So we can talk about the history of sterilization, the history of violence against indigenous women and women of color, to even just talking about uh, the sort of the cutting of social services to marginalized women, which are oftentimes women of color and indigenous women, to like flat out demonizing these women and their sexualities and so forth. And the root of that, again, falls within settler sexuality, which have not only demonized indigenous women, but also women of color, right? Slavery, for example, in the United States, was not only on a base of racial control, right? You know, creating, one, these concepts around race, of, around the idea of white and black, and then creating laws around that, you know? the sort of laws about what determines to be a black person and what determines to be a white person, who can have voting rights and who can, you know, have citizenship rights. But also it was a form of gendered power in regards to the demonization and sexualization, particularly of African-American women, their sexualities, their reproductive capabilities, and this long history of slavery, which is part of settler colonialism, has impacted us till now where we have incredible epidemic violence against particularly black women in regards to sexual assault and so forth. We can talk about this history again around indigenous women. We can talk about this history around um, Latinx and Asian American women. The story repeats. It doesn't repeat exactly the same, but the processes are very much similar. So here we have a landscape where not only are women dispossessed and women are inferior are seen as inferior and the sort of patriarchal norms are placed onto not only indigenous populations but other populations coming into this country but it's also very much a racial hierarchy as well as a very sexualized hierarchy which demonized uh, 
uh, women of color and indigenous women's sexuality, sensualities, they're erotic, essentially. And that's where the piece Guadalupe Sex Goddess comes in, because it's an interesting piece in regards to looking at the histories of colonization that have demonized particularly indigenous and Latinx women and their sexuality and there's just like their own physical bodies. And at the same time, going back and reclaiming and fighting against these colonial narratives. One of the basic goddess, so the piece uh, by Cisneros, is a really important piece, um, but it's also very much a great representation of just the broad and huge body of work that Chicana, Chicana feminism has brought forward in regards to not only discussions around sexuality, but also just empowerment and decolonization and so forth. A big part of if you wanted to sort of this wide body of literature, and you can take amazing courses here on campus around Chicanx, Latinx feminism, but a big part if you want to sort of like, you know, create sort of an umbrella around this diverse pieces of work is around reclaiming particularly the Latinx Chicanx body from the histories of colonization and U.S. imperialism. So reclaiming it, taking it out of these very settler, colonial, white, heteropatriarchal narratives and reclaiming it, both seeing the beauty of it, the love of it, as well as, you know, seeing it as a source of power. And in that then, you know, talking about the historical and continuous uh, oppression of Chicanx, Latinx women, in the face of colonization, particularly settler colonization. So looking at the enforced suppression and enslavement of indigenous women by conquistadors, and then seeing that as a continuous pattern. So not something that was like in the past, but something that is very much influencing the present uh, around the denial of Chicano, Chicana's lands, labor, and citizenship rights by the U.S. government. So seeing this as a continuous thread of oppression. And in that sort of looking at the, 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 the thread of oppression, talking about how it is also not only a very racialized power in regards to suppressing and demonizing Chicanx Latinx individuals, by the predominant U.S. states government or settler colonialism in the past and as well as in the present, but talking about how it's also very much a gendered narrative in regards to demonizing Chicanas as whores and betrayers um, and stereotypes of, and seeing that, you know, in the past as well as in the present in regards to stereotypes of Latinx women as sexually available, spicy Latinas. So looking at, for example, the history, um, that Guadalupe Sex Goddess talks about in regards to, uh, La Malinche or Malinali. So La Malinche was a Nahua woman uh, who lived uh, between approximately 1501 and 1529. She was one of 20 slaves given to Hernan Cortez. Later, she was the forced mistress. And again, you know, these narratives are written by the, the conquistadors. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt there. It's not written by the indigenous community but was later the mistress of Cortez and gave birth to their son, Martin, known as the first mestizo. Now, she has been used as a very much a controversial figure, used to degrade Chicanas um, to show her, seeing her as this sort of dangerous, sexually available, slutty woman, and has been used to very much demonize Chicanas as well, both within Mexico as well as across the United States and so forth. It's a very um, problematic narrative, and unfortunately, it's a narrative that has been used for many indigenous women, uh, whether we look at Pocahontas, to also women of color like Sally Hemings and so forth. And in this piece, Guadalupe Sex Goddess, she, talks, she, she takes La Malanche and she reclaims her. She sees... She sees the image of the Guadalupe, La Guadalupe, 
and looks and sort of peels away the layers of narratives that have been used to demonize particularly Chicanas of their bodies, of their sexualities, of their power, and reclaiming, you know, aspects of La Guadalupe that, you know, involve La Malanche or Malinali from a negative to looking at her in a positive aspect as a survivor and a capable woman. And in that, you know, this piece, uh, Cineros uh, also sort of talks about this dichotomy that has been placed upon Chicanas around the Madonna or the La Guadalupe and the whore, the, Mala, the La Malanenche. And seeing these as a way that, you know, these two dichotomies, the virgin and the whore, as not only impossible as something that we've talked about before, but very much our work to make women, particularly Chicanas, as objects as, instead of subjects, which have their own authority, agency, and so forth. Doing exactly what Audre Lorde has argued in which connecting sexuality through the body, mind, and spirit. These two dichotomies are very much using a way to separate women from their sense of the erotic, their own sexual power, and so forth. And that is why in this piece, uh, Cineros uh, looks at La Guadalupe and peels away the lay layers, these very colonial la layers that have been used to demonize particularly Chicano women. So she looks at then, when you peel that layer, when you go back to the sources, you see indigenous female sexualities and powers such as Tanatzin and then many other fertility goddesses, mother goddesses within her. And in that reclaiming, you know, you see a sense of love, female empowerment, and so forth. So something that I want you to explore as you read these pieces and listen to the podcast and watch the videos is around how the erotic and then looking at, for example, of Guadalupe sex goddess around how it can be an act of decolonizing our sexualities. You know, so asking questions about how can reclaiming the erotic also be about challenging larger institutions of power? And how can reclaiming the erotic be an act against settler colonialism and heteropatriarchy? So again, you know, explore, uh, do the readings, listen to the podcast, watch the videos. And this really is meant for you to sort of unpack these narratives. There's no right or wrong, but I want you to really sort of think deeply about these. And if, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. And yeah, I really look forward to the, reading your responses.